Hey, before we go any farther, how many of you have had a chance to get a get your book and look at your book? How many people have looked over your book? That's good. Most of you who have who has no idea what I'm talking about with this book. Would you raise your hand? Would you raise? If you'll raise your hand, keep it raised up. If if our ushers would uh, uh, pass one of these out for you, we'll we'll share just a little bit more about it here in just a minute. This is a book that we that we put together. And I say we primarily, I mean, I put a lot of the thoughts into it, but I will admit that my daughter, Lauren, did, well, not most, she did it all. I gave her the content, a lot of the content, and, uh, and she went with it and made it, made it happen. So she, she's awesome. She, her and Abri are gone to um, one of their friend's weddings uh, that's taking place today in Columbus, so they're out. But uh, this is an awesome awesome book and if you haven't had one we would appreciate you looking at one because what it really is describing and we're on the third week this is the third message within this within this uh, series that we call the bridge what we're talking about is building a bridge to the future for Kingsway Church and I don't have time to go back into the depth of the, some of the things that we've covered we've had the dinners we've and, and went over this we've had the the, the, the vision night on Wednesday night and we've talked about it a little bit up to here we've had two messages one called the Jesus Bridge and last week Pastor Huffman preaching uh, the message called having uh, being courageous enough to cross over the bridge and so the bridge is a new building and uh, can, do we have that up there guys that we can show real quick um, what that new building would look like now the building with all of the glass is the bridge the building to the right of it that connects to it is a new sanctuary at a later date. But we have went ahead and designed it and put it into place. You say, well, you don't really need a new building. Well, that's just because you're seeing what you see right now. See, if you say that, then what you're seeing is what you see now. Faith doesn't look at right this minute. It doesn't only perceive what is in front of it. It looks beyond. And in our vision, in our mind, the building is completely, utterly full. The parking lot and every parking place is maxed out. And we have problems. Those would be good problems, right? Well, we have problems. And so within that, the thought primarily behind the bridge was this. And not just to create a new sanctuary, because to be frank with you, the new sanctuary in this particular, can we go to the... Uh, to the blueprint, blueprint diagram. The sanctuary is very similar to the size, uh, to the current sanctuary. So it wasn't that we're just building a bigger sanctuary necessarily, but what we're doing is taking this facility, once we build a new sanctuary, we're taking this facility and putting a wall uh, right here where Tammy's at. Wave, wave your hand, Tammy. So everybody see right about, she's right in the wall space right there. And so the wall would be there. And on this side of the wall would be children's, the Children's Church Sanctuary. On the other side of the wall would be an indoor playground. And so we are thinking about not just our future, but maybe more importantly, we're thinking about your children, and watch now, and your grandchildren's future. I'm not just thinking about me. If I was thinking about me, you know, it, or just, just us right now, we'd live for the moment and we'd fire away. But see, we can't stop. It, the, the, the gospel of Jesus Christ is not just to be taken in context for just the present. It has to be thinking about the future. I was thinking about this property day one. Debbie can tell you, I literally, well, not literally. Okay. Crazy. We was in the downtown building. Y'all, how many have been in the downtown building? Mo most of you, a lot of you, right? That recently sold, and I'm going to share that with you real quick as well. When it sold, buildings, and how, now I look back and I go, what an idiot. I was already thinking about this isn't going to work for long. It was already my mindset. I was looking as far as size and capacity and, and opportunity, all those kind of things. I was always thinking about that, and, and nothing's changed. I'm still thinking about tomorrow. And I'm not just thinking about you. I'm thinking about your kids and your grandkids because this is never meant, I don't believe that God ever meant for us to be a one-generation church. 
here today, gone tomorrow. I believe that God wanted a, a full gospel church that would preach the uncompromising word of God, that wouldn't bow to, to you know, and don't, don't take this wrong if you are a part of a denominational church, but would not bow to pressure that it has to be just this or that way. And I'm not against that. I'm for every church that's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. I know that, you know, people do what they have to do. But we just said, no, we're going to preach a message that's going to line up with the Bible. And we're going to let it go. We're going to let it fly, see what happens. And uh, so we were always thinking about the future. We're always thinking about your kids. We're always thinking about your grandkids and their children. And so we had the opportunity just recently. We had our downtown building lease that we still owned, and we were leasing it. And, and uh, we had the opportunity, the, the leasers, uh, leases had, had to leave. They were running a church there, and so they, they had to leave. And uh, so we just put it on the market. I thought, man, it's an 1874 building. How long might this thing could take a while to sell, right? I, and we are down in Hilton Head splashing around in the pool one day, and I get a phone call from the real estate agent that says, uh, I got an offer like three weeks later. I got an offer on your building. And I'm like, hallelujah. Praise the Lord. And, and, and so, you know, one thing led to another. We ended up selling the building. We got a net proceeds out of it of $230,000. We had already begun to think about the bridge and put the thoughts together as to what we were going to do. And the whole project, we estimate somewhere around four, four and a quarter to, to build the bridge, somewhere in that ballpark. And uh, so 230 will go a long way towards that four, four and a quarter, right? I mean, that's a pretty good punch. And so we begin to to go through the process and go through this, get blueprints built. And you know what? Uh, we're not just going to, we don't live in the world of I Dream of Genie. You all remember that show? I'm telling my age here. We don't, we don't live in that age where we just blink and something happens. It takes preparation, time. It takes prayer. It takes dedication, loyalty, and it takes money. It takes commitment. It doesn't take. It doesn't just happen. Things don't just happen. We didn't. We're not here just because we just chose to be one day. Just flipped a finger. It took a lot of effort. I'm telling you, a lot of effort to get here. If you'd see the hours and the money and the time that's been put in the, the put into the, the the property. Oh, you know, I I think they estimated our property up here was worth about a million eight okay well how do you think that that happened I, I i mean some some somebody asked me one time said you know i guess they think we just have all gobs of money or something they say how so how long you been propping it up and i said never ever i've never given a dime more than i wouldn't have give somewhere else you know based on uh, where we were at we'd have done the same thing we've not just said hey we we're gonna have to make sure it survives you all have made it survive and the people before you and people have been here for a while and then moved on to somewhere, you know, different places and so forth. It's all been because of people like you and you that have been faithful to do what, what God has put inside your heart. So this is what this is about, about building the bridge that will build tomorrow, that will build the next generation. And so today is actually Pledge Day cards. If, um, if I could get our ushers to go ahead and just, just, you know, pass these out one more time. You may have one. You may have already done it. And you may not want to do it. And that's okay. So there's no pressure. Just as they pass these out, just pass them out to everybody. But whether or not uh, uh, you want to do it or not is okay. We're not, there's no pressure. We're, our intention is never to, to try to make anybody feel like they have to do something. We perceive this as an opportunity. Simply, if you want to be a part of it, there's different ways that you could give. You could give uh, weekly for two years. You could give monthly for two years. You give one-time gifts. You even give assets. You know, if you have something that maybe isn't necessarily monetary, but, you know, uh, listen, there's all kinds of uh, things that you can do as far as giving to a church um, to where you can will property. I mean, there's all kinds of different things that people can do to be a blessing if they want to do it. Now, that's just, just you know, just to give you some insight on that. Now, we're going to receive at the end of this service, we're going to receive the pledge cards. And for anybody that isn't here today or couldn't make it or maybe they weren't prepared but want to do something next week, we're going to give you one more chance at the, at the time of the offering uh, to finalize that. And then we're going to give you a total, a tally next week. We're going to be totally transparent, show you everything that is ready to come in so that you know what the plans are. Our intention, we have every desire and hope that we'll be able to get this thing started sometime 
either in the spring or early summer. That is what our intentions are. So, uh, we, but obviously, some of that depends on some things, but that's what we're believing God for. So there it is, and uh, we just ask you to, to you know, pray. Don't do anything. The Bible says don't give grudgingly or of necessity. So I'm going to repeat the Bible. Don't give grudgingly or of necessity or feeling like you have to. That's another way for saying that. But give how? Cheerfully. If you can't give it cheerfully, I'm telling you, I promise you, hang on. Just hang on to it. I'd rather you hang on to it if you can't do it cheerfully. So, And, and maybe it's a time in your life you can't, but um, that's fine. But if you can do it cheerfully and you want to do it, then, man, we're going to hook up. We're going to receive it. And when this thing gets done, I'm telling you, watch what will happen. It will be a, such a major blessing to us in so many ways, and I, I don't have time to tell you all the different possibilities that we'll be able to use that building for besides being a bridge to the next, to the next uh, uh, project to get, the, uh, to get the kids in here. There will be lots of other opportunities that we can use it for. Anyway, so there we are. So you pray about that, and uh, by the end of service, we are going to receive those, and then next Sunday on the offering as well, and then we're going to give you a total and rejoice. As I look back a few years in planning to build a building that would move us from 311 17th Street to Providence Hill, I admit that my primary thought was on adults and the adult sanctuary. Oh, I knew that we had to have a space for children's church, preschool, nursery, and youth, but they were not my primary concern because, after all, they weren't my primary ministry. I have stated in the past that my biggest mistake in building our current church home was not allowing enough space for the growth of children's church. With that said, I do not want to make the same mistake twice. Many times, children help convince parents that a church they visit is the right choice for them. The bridge that we have been talking about is really two or I should say threefold. First, it will serve as a new entry allowing additional room for fellowshipping before and after service. It will host extra events not related to church services and it will allow for a much larger kitchen. Secondly, it will serve as the bridge to a future new sanctuary that will sit in between our current structure and the new sanctuary. And third, the bridge will not only serve as the bridge for a new adult sanctuary, but it will also serve as the bridge to a real sanctuary for children's church. Our current sanctuary will eventually become the home to children's church, hosting an indoor playground. The youth will then be given the entire upstairs area. So why all of this? Because our children are worth the effort. As people begin to see the heart our church has towards children, we will see more growth and more lives changed. I've often said to established Christians that church is primarily not about you any longer. Yes, of course, you need to be encouraged, and yes, you need help during challenges. But at one time, it was all about you and all about winning you. We want to win, establish, and prepare children for the next step in walking with God. We want to develop your children to find God and potentially prepare some for ministry roles. This bridge that we are proposing is not just to build a new building or just to have another sanctuary, but also to establish a proper home for our children. This new home for your children will, will allow for the next generation to be prepared to take the reins from us and continue winning our community and our world for Jesus Christ. Will you help us build the bridge for the next generation? How cool, huh? So you can kind of get a good idea as to where, where my thoughts are this morning. I want to continue, obviously, with uh, what we started on the bridge, but I want to talk about the generational bridge. <clears throat> I want to talk about uh, what it's going to mean and what it's going to look like and what it's always really looked like 
for people after you get to a place of establishment in your relationship with God, you know, just like what I, I was saying in that in that uh, little short video, church is really for a mature Christian, which I hope most of you are. For a mature Christian, uh, church is not so much for you. Yes, of course you want to come worship. Of course you need to be fed, and of course you need to be encouraged. And there's times that you go through battles that you need somebody to join with you. Of course, we, we understand all that. But primarily, church is about reaching somebody that doesn't know about Jesus. Now, if your thought is, is no, I don't care about anybody else. I want the kind of music I like, and I want the kind of message I like, or else I'm going to leave. Well, then you just told me that it's really, it's solely about you. There's no thought about anybody else. And that, in and of itself, is not representative of the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's about reaching the world. He said in uh, Mark, go into all the world and preach the gospel. So our, our priority is to go into all the world. In, in, and it doesn't necessarily mean go into all the world in the sense of uh, Kingsway Church, go into Germany and, and uh, you know Russia and China and all these different places. But go into our part of the world. Do what we can do in our world to change the world. And so we started thinking about this and realizing how important it is to look towards the future. It isn't just about today. I'm not, I'm, I'm, you know, there's obviously things to do today, but there's things to do tomorrow. And when I started thinking about a bridge, and Pastor Jason helped me with that thought, put that thought together on that, we started thinking about, you know, a bridge is something that joins two masses together, right? It's a place that you want to get to, but you otherwise couldn't get there without a bridge we even looked at it uh, a couple of weeks ago talking about the rich man when he lifted up his eyes in hell and he said and he looked across the great gulf and he saw abraham and he said father abraham send lazarus that he may uh, put his finger to the water and tip it to my and put it to, to the tip of my tongue for i'm tormented in this flame and of course you know the, the story abraham said well look neither anybody can we can't come from here to go to there and nobody can come from there to go to here I bet he would have loved to have had a bridge because it was a great gulf fixed between the two, two points that he couldn't get to where he wanted to be. And so we talked about that in the Jesus Bridge. And then there's times in life that, frankly, you have to cross over. And Lee built me a, a bridge here, but it's, some of you can't see. It's not quite finished yet. I've got a mass in between me here that I can't get through or a space in between me that I can't get through. But you can get on it sometimes. You can get on a bridge and it seems scary because you're going maybe somewhere you've never gone before. And it takes courage to get from one place to another. Uh, sometimes there's been people that have, and, and I'm not in favor of that. We're never about proselyting people from one church to another. We don't be believe in that. But sometimes when there's a change that's necessary, we have saw it takes courage because you, it's changing from something different to something new. And it, and it takes courageous something courageous to do that because it feels like whoa wait change people generally hate change because it's different and they get used to certain things and you've, we've seen people come in they get used to their chair and it's like bless God this is my chair don't set my chair I sit here every Sunday and how dare you sit in my space and sometimes in the past I haven't done it I don't think I've done it since we moved in, into this building but in the old building I, one time I come in I said everybody on the left get up go to the right everybody on the right go to the left it freaked everybody out. I don't think they heard anything that day that I preached about it because it was like, this is weird. I'm in the wrong place. I said, but they just get comfortable. People get comfortable. And so it takes courage. And then it takes courage to give something knowing that uh, this is going to cost. There's, there's sacrifice with everything. Anytime, I mean, when you bought your first house or you bought your first car, it takes courage because it means... I don't know if I can do this or not, but, but you step out to do it. And so it takes courage to change anything that is uh, going from one thing to another. And I was thinking about, you know, years ago we went on vacation down to uh, Fort Lauderdale. And one day we thought, we're going to go to Key West. And so we drove down and we, we drove to Key West. And anybody ever drove on the bridge from wherever it starts there close to Miami and going to Key West? I'm telling you, man, that is a freaky bridge. 
it feels like the, you know like you're driving on the ocean for miles doesn't it i mean it is crazy cool but crazy and you could look at that and almost kind of get a little tore up over it like man the water could splash up on me at any time you know and it could get you could get concerned about it well obviously it, it works right because we've been there others have been there and people are on it every single day but they get from one place to another place i thought in numbers Numbers, and we, we look at a lot there, there, but there's a lot to glean from in Numbers 13. And just, I'll tell you what, go to Numbers 14 for just a minute. Let me just kind of jump, leap, leapfrog from here, and then we'll get going. Numbers chapter 14, you know the story. Um, Moses has sent in the 12 spies, and I'm going to make one quick point here. He sends in the 12 spies to spy out the promised land. God has promised them this land. They're supposed to have it. It's God ordained. It's God blessed. And they go in and there's 10 of the 12 that come back with what was considered an evil report because it was a report of unbelief. It was simply it. You know, I heard Keith Moore say this one time. He said, uh, not that I'm advocating cussing. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. So I'll make sure and qualify that. I'm not advocating that. But he said, but doubt and unbelief sometimes is worse than a cuss word because it actually goes against the things of God it actually goes against what God is wanting to do and so these guys were actually in a place to where all they had to do was say God said he's given it to us and respond to it but they didn't they came back with a report that was a, a report of doubt and unbelief and they said they couldn't do it because they they were looking just at the natural. Like I said just a minute ago, if you just looked at today, you might say, well, do we really need this or do we really need that? Well, they weren't looking. That, that, that God wasn't looking at just today. He was thinking about tomorrow and the next day. But they saw today, and what they saw was ten, the ten spies saw giants. And then they saw, weirdly, through the eyes of the giants, how they did that, I don't know. But they saw through the eyes of the giants themselves as grasshoppers. Now, Joshua and Caleb saw something entirely different. They saw the land that God had said was, was a good land and that would provide for them. And they came back and said, we're well able to do it. But watch, this is what I want you to see. This is what happens when leadership does not have courage. If you don't have courage as far as a leader, and that's what we're supposed to be. If you're, if you're a Christian, you're supposed to be a leader. At some point, you, know, you have to quit being a receiver and being a giver. And I don't mean financially. That's not what I'm talking about. But you have to get to the place to where it's like, I'm pouring out rather than having to always be poured into. And so... These guys, the two guys came in, Joshua and Caleb, they saw something different, and they said, we're well able, we can do it. Let's have courage to do it. The other ten didn't have courage. And watch this. In verse 1 and 14, And all the congregation lifted up their voice, all the congregation, all the congregation lifted up their voice and cried, and the people wept that night, and all the children of Israel murmured against Moses and against Aaron. Why were they murmuring? Why were they complaining? Why were they weeping? Because they bit on what the ten said rather than what on the two said. And in reality, what would have happened if the, tw the twelve entirely would have come back, joined together and said, we can do it. The ten were still in a phase in their life where they needed to be poured into. The two were in a phase in their life where they were in a place to pour out of. And so the ten overtook the entire congregation. And I said that to say this. Leadership in walking a Christian walk means this, that we are courageous. We're supposed to be courageous. We're supposed to look different. We're supposed to take risks, supposedly, if, if you want to call it that. Uh, risk when you're doing something uh, as God has, I believe, given you a mandate is never a risk. But it might feel like a risk. You know, it's kind of like sometimes it feels risky, but in reality, it, it isn't. But there is an old, an old saying that says what? No risk. Help, somebody help me. 
no reward. I believe that it's there is times that you just have to, you know, if, if you'll let me use that phrase, just take a risk. Because if you sit there and just wait, and you're just waiting for everything to be perfect, if we were waiting for everything to have been perfect, that would have meant that you guys would have had to show up before we ever took a first step, knocking on my door saying, I think you guys ought to start a church. And then I'd have saw them, you know, a reasonable mass of people and went, hallelujah, praise the Lord, let's start a church. But we had to start it when nobody, you've heard a little bit of this story, I mean before, when we went to the bank to borrow the money, we, we was borrowing like three hundred and forty or fifty, sixty thousand dollars $60,000, something like that. And, and so the banker says, well, um, tell me about your church. And I said, yes, sir, what would you like to know? Well, to start, how many people do you have? I said, we have four. And I said it courageously. We have four. And he said, four? I said, that's me and my wife and my two daughters, and we'll all tithe. And he's like, four? You don't have anybody? Uh, he said, you serious? You have no? I said, I, I, I wish kind of that I wasn't, but no, I got four. That's what we got. But I am believing God. Believe in God, people will show up. Well, that took courage, right? Well, that's what leadership does. Leadership takes a step of faith and does things when it doesn't necessarily see the answers. And, and I thought I was thinking about Saul. Saul had gotten to the place to where he was not responding to what God had told him to do. And so that God said he had to change some things. Now, he sends Samuel, which was a risk in and of itself, right? Samuel has to go, and because God told him to go and anoint David to be the next king. And Samuel said, whoa, if Saul finds out I'm going to anoint his, the one that's going to take his place, he'll kill me. Does that take courage? But there's a bigger plan. There's something that's, more, that's worth the risk. He took the, uh, the horn of oil, anointed David in the midst of his brethren, and the Spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. There was another risk that he had to do it in front of his seven older brothers. I mean, you remember when, when Samuel went in? Because he didn't know which one it was going to be. He walked in, and Eliab was there, and he looked at him, and there must have been something very obvious to his naked eye. But look, you can't just look at the, at the obvious. If you looked at the obvious, would he have anointed Eliab as the next king? Because he looked at him, and he said, watch this, surely the Lord's anointed is before me. Because there was obviously something very st structurally sound about Eliab. Kind of look like me, you know? No, just kidding. <laughs> Get some of these big, you know, some big guy come in and stands out and he towers in the room. He just looks like a king, you know? And that must have been what Eliab looked like. He looks at him and goes, uh, the Lord spoke to him and said, no, it's not him. So he makes all seven of them pass. And he said, do you have any other sons? Well, I've got a little peon son. He's out in the field tending the sheep. Because that's obviously not a, a significant thing, right? Doesn't seem to be. But what is he doing out there tending the sheep? He's out there protecting them from lions and bears, and he's getting his faith built up so that when he faces the giant, what will he say? Will he run like Eliab was or like Saul was? Or will he look at the giant and say, uh, this uncircumcised Philistine, who does he think he is? He'll, God uh, uh, delivered me out of the hand of the paw of the lion and the bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will just be just like one of them courage was being developed because he was spending time with God and he recognized that he's a leader and I started also thinking about you know in a day you know because we started this thing like in what was it 1991 I got saved in the, in the, in the fall of 1991 and so I've been doing it for a few years, you know, and I've seen a lot of wonderful ministries, been a, lot of, been a part of a lot of wonderful ministries. I mean, you say Kenneth Hagin, and somebody, how many of you have ever heard of Kenneth Hagin? Oh, that's most. But there's probably, how many of, let me do it like this, how many of you have never heard of Kenneth Hagin? There's a few. Okay. Um, Billy Graham, right? You ever heard of Billy Graham? Right. Y'all ever heard of uh, John Osteen? 
Some of you don't know that. That's Joel's dad, right? And uh, other great ministers, Oral Roberts, wonderful. But that was a different era. We're living in a different time than what Kenneth Hagin was ministering in, what Oral Roberts was ministering in, what Billy Graham was ministering in, and it's different now. Now, now the message hasn't changed. The Lord was very specific to me one time when he told me I was going to preach somewhere, and he said, I want you to give me a certain message, and he said, I want you to preach this, that the message never changes, but the method of delivery is constantly changing. You say, I don't like that. I I think we'll do it the same way. Then you'll stay in a rut if that's what you're thinking. You think the message, the delivery of of the message hasn't changed over the last 2,000 years? Give me a break. You know it has. Now, has the message changed? No, and it shouldn't. The message stays the same, but the method of delivery, and that primarily has to do with the personality of the messenger. Because my, my personality is different than somebody else. Have, have you all ever heard of uh, Stephen Furtick? I mean, Stephen Furtick is out of the box and wild. And, and you don't have to. You, you might say, I don't particularly like him. That's all right. But he's reaching certain people, right? You all heard of Joel Osteen? And Joel's reaching certain people. Okay, well, he, he's not going to get anybody. Not any one person gets every one person. And we're in an era to where we have to realize, you know, I was thinking about we went to Bethel a few uh, months ago, and Bill Johnson, I don't know if anybody ever heard of Bill Johnson, but Bill Johnson is is an older guy. But you know what? He's very appealing to young people. I don't get it because I've never been very appealing to young people. For some reason, I always connected well with older people, but I didn't necessarily connect super well with young people. That's why they, they don't want me in children's church. They don't want me. They didn't want me doing youth. Because I, I just didn't talk that for whatever reason. I just didn't, I wasn't, just didn't connect well. Bill Johnson, Chris Valentin, those guys seem to connect well with younger people, just like a, a Stephen Furtick. My point is this. Everybody has different things, and things change as time goes by. We're not against, we don't want to stay in the same way. We want to, to recognize that there's a move of God that can take place within us. And it, and it may be, have to be different because we're talking about seeing different people. Kids, uh, they, they're raised differently today than what they was then. And so we've got to find out right where they're at. What do we got to do to get them then? Now, notice this in Matthew chapter 4, verse 18. It says, And Jesus was walking by the Sea of Galilee. He saw two of his brethren, Simon called uh, Peter and Andrew his brother, casting a net in the sea, for they were fishers. And he said unto them, Follow me, and I'll make you fishers of men. Now notice this, I kind of wonder why did he use this phrase? And, and really two reasons, I believe. Number one, it was what they could relate to. They're fishermen, so, you know, that kind of connected. I'll show you how to be a fisher of men. But also, I believe this. I believe that he was also showing that men are like fish in the sense that they need to be caught. They need to be lured. They need to, to see something. And the number one lure, whatever you want to call it, however you want to look at it, the number one lure that will draw people to God, and we haven't done a really good job at this, by the way, but the number one lure that will attract people to the kingdom of God is this, that God is always good. The Bible tells us in Romans 2, 4, don't you know that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repentance? In other words, he's phrasing that in a question like, I can't believe you didn't know that. Don't you understand that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repent? Now, we through the years have, have, and and we've done it with our kids too, we've tried, if you'll just pardon my expression, don't go out here saying I'm cussing, but we've tried to scare the hell out of kids and people. We've tried to scare the hell out of them. And rather than scaring them with the, the possibility of hell, now don't get me wrong, they need to know that that is part of what could happen but that's not what should be leading people to follow Jesus because that's a fear gospel that's trying to scare somebody into something and that usually don't take and even if it does it don't stay it doesn't have staying power but if I could convince you if I could convince your kids if I could convince your family 
that God is always good that everything about God is a good God and the structure and you don't you don't have to understand everything I don't understand everything about God I don't have everything down I mean you can't come to me and say just give me just give it all to me you know everything I, I mean I'm pretty limited I know some things I know as much as as I have revelation on within his word and 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 but there's a lot of things I don't know I, I, and, and here's the bottom line is, and I've used this phrase before, I don't have to know how the watch is made in order to be able to tell time. I can enjoy the benefits of the watch, know what time it is, without knowing how. I have no idea. Do you all know how a watch works? I mean, like every component, and some of you probably could tear it apart and put it back together. Me, if, it, if I tear it apart, it's gone. I mean, it is out. It's over with. I got a bicycle for the kids when they were little one, one Christmas. And I said, I'm going to put the box together. And Debbie was upstairs cooking or something. And I said, I'm going to go down the basement and put it together, you know. So I go down there, put it together. I come back, and I said, I got it. I was really, you know, thrilled that I, I was able to do it. And she goes, uh, I'm going to come down and inspect it here in just a little bit. And I said, I just don't understand why they sent us so many extra parts. She said, what are you talking, did you read the instructions? I said, of course not. Men don't read instructions. We just know stuff. She went down, read the instructions, and amazingly, every single part had a certain place it had to go. So she put the bike back together, right? So you don't want me fixing a watch, but my point is I don't have to know everything. That's part of what faith is about, not knowing everything. But just recognizing, I, I, I believe you, I trust you. And this is part of the, the, the things that we've missed when it comes to our kids. We've missed just telling them, hey, this is what will be the attraction. This is the bait that will lure them to the kingdom of God. And it's like uh, when, we, when we go to children's church, do you know the kids, I'm, I'm, I don't know exactly that, Eddie could tell me probably, but the exact details as to how they get some of their prizes. And they got good stuff, right? I mean, we spend, look, watch now, thousands of dollars. Thousands. What do you, you could have, you could have, you spent $8,000 buying toys? Well, that could have been given to the poor. That could have been given to the gospel. Exactly. What do you mean? We're buying a kid a toy? Yes, because we're trying to infiltrate their mind that when you come to church, God is good. God wants to bless you. God loves you. We love you. We want you to be here. We have an intention for you. We have a destiny to help you to, to discover. And you can't discover it if you're not in the presence of God. If, you're not, if you don't have any knowledge of that. Now don't write me no ugly letter or pull me aside and chastise me because I'm telling you, if you're trying to talk me out of like making sure the kids got good stuff, good toys, because it'll fall on deaf ears. Because I'm already, it's hard to change the mind of somebody who's already convinced. And I'm already convinced that to be a blessing to our children gives me the greatest opportunity to be able to say something that they will retain. And my goal is not to give them a toy. My goal is to get their attention. My goal is to get them to hear what I have to say. Not me, because I'm not, I told you, I'm not good at children's church, right? Remember I heard Jesse Duplantis say one time, he said, uh, somebody asked him about working in children's church. He said, sure, just show me where the duct tape is. I mean, you can get an idea. So I don't, uh, that's probably not the right place for me, but we're going to position the people that are called to those ministries and put them in the best possible place so that they can minister to those kids. Amen? So if you're a first-time visitor today and you've got a kid, I bet they get some, do they get some kind of toy first-time visitor? Like, it's okay, they get some kind of toy. And it's not junk toys. It's like good stuff. Why? Why is that important? Because I can remember, not that, not that it's, you know, we're, we're evolving, we're getting better, we're, we're figuring things out. You know, you, come, you give a little kid a little toy that'll be broke before they ever make it to the car, it don't make much of an impression. But you spend a little bit of money in them and you say, listen, you're worth it. I want you to enjoy this. Now, I ain't saying it's going to last forever. But my, hopefully it'll make it at least, you know, for a week or two by the time they get home, right? So we want to teach people that God is good, and we want to teach your kids that God is good. 
And if something isn't working very well, like things like when we tell people, well, God doesn't want you blessed. Well, you're poor for a reason. Or, or you know what? You know, God's trying to teach your kids something because, uh, you know, that's why he put sickness on, on them. Well, if that's the kind of stuff that we're doing, let's, why don't we analyze and see how, how much room are we really developing in? Are we really, really winning people like that? Because that does not signify that God is always good. Amen. Just in case you're wondering, we always we believe around in, at our church that God wants you blessed. I, I'm not saying it's not like a slot machine. Don't misunderstand what I'm saying. Like one day you come in, you put a dollar in the offering, and the next day God sends you millions of dollars. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying God wants you blessed. He wants you to have more than enough to be able to meet your needs and have more than enough to be in position to help others and do things. God wants that for us. I can prove I don't have time to get into all that today, but I'm, I'm telling you, we, there's many scriptures that I could give you for that. I know this, that the Bible says that he took our infirmities and he bore our sicknesses. He tells us in Isaiah chapter 53 that he bore those. And he said that it ple- the Bible says that it pleased him to be able to do that to Jesus so that we could be the beneficiaries of it. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. All we have been like sheep that have turned away everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. What is it, the next one? Uh, He was oppressed. He was afflicted, yet opened not his mouth. This is all prophecy about Jesus. He is brought as a lamb to to the slaughter. And as a sheep before the shears is dumb, so he opened not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment who declared this his generation. He was out of the land of the living for the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he was made his grave with the wicked and the rich in his death because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. I believe it's right here. And look down at the last part of this. And the pleasure and, and the pleasure of the Lord, it, well, you know, yeah, at the top, it pleased the Lord to bruise him and he hath put him to grief, and when he shall make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, and, his, uh, and he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. It pleased the Lord to bruise Jesus. Now that, that, that sounds foreign, doesn't it? It pleased him to do it. Why? Because he wanted our healing. He wanted us to be, able, to be in a position to be healed. He blesses us. He wants us uh, to, to get to the place to where we can enjoy uh, being the, the, the people that, that he's called us to be. I talked about this Wednesday in Psalms 35, verse 27. It says, Let the Lord be magnified, which has, uh, has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. How, how can we mess this stuff up? The Lord takes pleasure in his servants prospering. Now, I'm not talking about being, you know, go crazy with that thought. I'm not saying you got to, in order to be considered prosperous, that you got to have millions and millions of dollars. But prosperity just means more than enough. The Lord takes pleasure in his servants prospering. Well, what if we begin to teach the things that God really wants us to teach? Our kids are going to be drawn to this. They're going to be drawn to this kind of stuff because. If you tell me some negative things, you say, uh, for example, uh, the Lord's going to strike you down. If you, you say one bad word, and I'm not advocating bad words, don't, don't go there. He, you do, you make one mistake, he's going to fly swat you. He's, he's, he, his eyes run to and fro to see who it is that he's going to fly swat. doesn't give me a lot of reason to want to serve God when somebody says that you know all things work together for good for those who love the Lord and I begin to see that it's the goodness of God that leads people to repent then it gives me an an idea that if I will share these type of things with the kids if we'll do that not only at a at a a individual le- level but also a church level you know that as an individual we should be growing in the lord growing in the knowledge and 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 wisdom and so forth 
Well, a church should be growing in the knowledge and the wisdom of the Lord and how to minister to the kids as well and how to minister to you as well. We should be growing, getting better. Every year I should, I should be a little bit more profound. Every year you should be a little bit more profound. We should be able to, to, to continue a growth process because this is what real leadership will do. What, did we, what was we talking about, uh, Joshua and Caleb? They represented real leadership because they were willing to say what God said and do what God said to do. They was willing to like what God liked and love what God, lo God loved. God loved them enough to give them the promised land, and they were willing to say it. But the other ten wasn't. What about today? What about you? What, what do you say? What, what is it that are the type of things that come out of your mouth? Everything that we do as a leader always carries with it a connection of sacrifice. In order to do some of the things that a church does, is able to do, it required sacrifice on somebody's part. And in many cases, in most cases, sacrifice from lots of people. Not just one, but lots of people. Because they're committed to it. They're doing things. They're, out, they're, they're, they're reaching out. They're, they're, they're dedicating their time, their money, their effort to things. So they're sacrificing something. What did Jesus sacrifice? Now, this is really where I want to dial into to, to get to a place where I can wrap this up. John chapter 12, if you'll turn there. And then look at John chapter 15. John 12, John 15. In John 12, verse 23, he said, And Jesus answered them, saying, The hour is come that the Son of Man should be glorified. Verily, verily, I say unto you, Except a corn of wheat fall into the ground and die, it abides alone. But if it die, it brings forth much fruit. Now, in this particular instance, he's talking about as for his parable's sake, his, his analogy's sake, he's talking about a corn of wheat. Unless it is put in the ground and dies, unless that happens, it doesn't produce anything. Right? How many of you know that seeds in your hand don't do much? But seeds in, in fertile ground develops growth of that particular seed, right? Now, watch what he says here, though. He says, but if it die, it brings forth much fruit. What was Jesus really talking about? He what really was he was just using that so you could, you could go. Oh, oh, I get it. Oh, I see what you're talking about. He wasn't really referencing a corn of wheat. He wasn't trying to teach people how to 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 be a farmer. That wasn't the thought. He was talking about himself. In essence, what he was saying is, unless I die. There can be no other fruit. But, but fruit of what? What happened when Jesus died? Help me now. He was raised from the dead. He became the firstborn of the resurrection. He became the first man resurrected from death, from sin, from, from not, not sin, but he took on our sin. He, he never sinned, but he took your and my sin, right? So he was, he was, he died, was dead, but yet was raised back to life. And what he says for us is that we also are to bear much fruit. Now look over in uh, John chapter 15. He says, I am the vine, you are the branches. He that abides in me and I in him, the same brings forth much fruit. What fruit is he talking about? Because what I mean, if you if you if you plant a seed and it produces a an apple tree, what does the apple tree have on it? I mean, it's not hard. It has apples, right, on the apple tree. What happens when we die to self and we are following after Christ and we are making our commitments? We are making our sacrifices. We are dying like Jesus died. What should we be producing? I'm going to help you with this one. 
generational fruit. Jesus said that through his death, he would be the firstborn of the resurrection. Therefore, many would follow after him. Well, when we submit ourselves unto the Lord, what happens is we create generational fruit. When we're doing and sowing in the right places, then we should be producing fruit. I am utterly convinced that our church is supposed to grow. I had some people in the past that got angry because I talked about growth. They said, I want to stay. I like our church like it is. It's quaint. And I'm like, then you buy the building and you start a church and have 48 people. I'm not happy with 48 people. I'm not happy with 150 people. You say, well, you're supposed to be content. Content and happy are two different things. I'm content that God has given us and we have what we have and we appreciate it, but we're believing God for more. Why? You just want something bigger. Couldn't, you don't, you, you couldn't be farther from the truth. Every person that sits in a seat is reflective of a soul. Every person, watch this now, that is in this building has the potential to do something in someone else. Have you ever seen services where somebody comes to the altar and they get saved? I mean, come on, right? Of course. Do you know that in most occasions, most of the time that happened, what caused them to come was not the preacher? Because we've gotten to the, in this mindset where we're like, man, you know, I mean, I'm so awesome. Oh, an, uh, an awesome message. I preached them. I preached them into heaven. Uh, usually not. What happened was this most of the time. Somebody's been sowing seed into a person. Somebody's been talking to somebody. The Holy Spirit for sure has been talking with them. And there's been a development that's been taking place. There's something happening in that person. And nobody knows it. They come in and I could maybe preach uh, the Flintstones. I could say, yabba dabba do. Anybody want to get saved? And somebody come running forward. Why? It wasn't just your fabulous, wonderful message. It was because somebody had already begun to sow the seeds of God's love and God's goodness inside of them, and it drew them. And they were already, they were on the verge. All they needed was an invitation. And that's what we need to be, is we need to be people that are giving people encouragement and, and building them up so that we can get them here so that they can have those moments. And our kids, listen, what was it Pastor Huffman said last week about if a child gets born again before he's 18 or something like that, they had, what, a 70 or 80% chance of staying saved or something like that, whatever it was. I mean... What else do you need to know when you hear that? Let's win the children. Let's get children in here. Let's bear fruit. Let's bear generational fruit so that our kids will be developed so that the day comes when, you know, you ain't doing so well or, you, or, you, or you're tired and you need a break and you need some youth vitality pumped into you and we start turning the kids loose, which are at that point no longer kids, right? So we need to begin to build a generational church. And I heard something that was said. I read a book years ago. I'm getting ready to close. But I heard uh, uh, a number of years back, Lester Summerall said this. He said, success is no success at all without a successor. Success is no success at all without a successor. This would be a failure. We start a church, and a and, and, uh, little time down the road, I go, you know what? I'm all good. I step down, and, and next thing you know, things fall apart. Failure. That's a failure. Well, but we reached, yeah, we reached a few people, did a few good things, but the mission is not just for today. The mission is for tomorrow. The mission is to bear fruit. Each one of us should be fruit bearers. What kind of fruit? 
Listen to this. Turn to 2 Timothy, and I'm going to try to close right there. But while you turn to 2 Timothy, I'm going to read Isaiah. Isaiah 54, very familiar verse. You all know this, but, but maybe not. Maybe you haven't thought about it like this. Verse 17, no weapon formed against us, against you, shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against you in judgment, you shall condemn. Now, we usually stop right there. But that's not the end of it. He says this, referencing that. This, referencing no weapon formed against you shall prosper, and every tongue that shall rise against you, you shall, uh, in judgment, you shall condemn. This is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. We should be building heritages of faith. And not just your kids. Because, I mean, let me be, let me be blunt. How many of you love your kids? I mean, I mean, who's not going to raise their hand, right? In church, I mean, you're in church. I really hate that heathen. I mean, you're going to go, yeah, 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 I love my kids. Yes, yes, I love my kids, right? Of course, everybody loves their kid. It's pretty easy for you want them to be saved. How about somebody down the street? How about their kid? Do you love their kid? Not as much as your kid. And I just would submit this. You won't go to the extreme that you'll go for that kid that you will for your kid. And I get it. But does that not mean that that isn't still part of our responsibility? As pastor of a church, my responsibility is not just the people that are in the, in the main sanctuary. My responsibility is also your kids. And I want your kids hearing about Jesus. I want your kids to know that they can be born again that we are bearing fruit, that we're sowing something into their life that will take place and make a difference. Now watch this. In 2 Timothy 1.5, Paul says this. He says, When I call to remembrance the genuine faith that's in you, which dwelt first in your grandmother Lois and your mother Eunice, and I'm persuaded that it's in you also. Paul said, Timothy, he's talking to Timothy, I see a genuine faith that's in you. I first saw it in your grandmother Lois. And I also saw it in your mother Eunice. And I'm persuaded that it's in you too. But the story don't end right there. Because that just sends the picture, this is a happy home. Grandmother Lois loves Jesus. Mother Eunice loves Jesus. Everybody loves Jesus. This is Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. See, this is why that you have to read your Bible. You find different things. Watch this. Acts chapter 16, verse 1. Then came he to Derbe and Lystra. And behold, a certain disciple was there named Timotheus, Timothy the son of a certain woman which was a Jew and believed. Notice that it was, they pointed out to tell you that it was a believing, a Jesus-believing Jew. Now watch this. But, see, but always distinguishes something else. But his father was a Greek. Which tells us what? Eunice is a Jew who loves Jesus. She believes in Jesus. But Timothy's father is not a believer. He's a Greek. How many times do we know that families are like that? Their children are torn. They don't know what to believe. They try. They try to make a difference. That's why that our part is when we can get them here. If we can get them here. If we can get them to show up then we have an opportunity to bear fruit. That's when we can really make a difference. I do not have the ability to influence anyone that will not give me the forum to influence them. I can put everything on Facebook, but if nobody ever watches, 
how, how many people do I get to influence? If you don't show up here, then I don't get to influence you. What about your kids? The bridge is primarily about setting the tone for the next generation. Yes, we'll use it for many other things, but it's setting the tone for what the future holds. And I don't know everything about the future, but I do know this. I never imagined a one-generational church. And there have been steps that God has led us to. He's held us by the hand. It took a lot longer than I thought to get here, to be perfectly honest with you. When we first bought the building downtown and we did the remodel and there's been several people that was there from day one. Several of you got there shortly thereafter and been, been a part of it ever since. We, I didn't. I don't know about you, but Debbie really loved the building. And I was like, I don't care about the building. I just want to preach. And uh, I never dreamed that we'd be there 11 years. I thought three or four or five years. But it was 11 years. And then, 11 years, we came here and we've been here for a little better than three years. And I believe this. I believe God is saying, I'm speeding you up. Eleven years, three years, and I don't believe it'll be that long before we will fill this thing up, we'll fill it up, and the next building will be necessary, truly necessary, at which, at that point, I want you just to use your imagination for just one minute. Give me 60 seconds left. Imagine a wall right here. And the seats are stacked. So it's like in a bleacher. They're stacked right here. And imagine everybody that's a part of Children's Church, and they have their props, and they're teaching them about Jesus, and they can have real altar calls. They can make it be a genuine church, not a classroom. And then when the kids come in before service, all the all that area in the back there's got games and, and, and things they can do and play and they're sweaty and you get to take them home sweaty and they, they just had the best time they had the best time before service and then the, the children's church teacher says alright it's time for church to start and so they come in the doors and they come in and, and they sit attentively and they're ministered to and who knows maybe that particular Sunday three, three kids get born again and after it, they rejoice and they have fellowship. And then they go, okay, well, church is not out yet, so you can go and you can play in the playground area. And so they go out there and they play. And then the moms and dads and grandmothers and grandparents come in and they go, hey, little whoever you are, I don't remember your name. You ever done that to your kids? I don't remember your name, but come here anyway. <laughs> right? And then, and then you see them, and, the, and you see the joy that they're having, and the parents go, I love this place. I love this place because they care about my kids. They love my kids. Last story is a number of years ago. Pastor Huffman, I'll show you how I'm, I'm done. <laughs> a long time ago, first year or two, we were down in the old building. We invited Pastor Huffman's son, Josh Huffman, to come preach for us. And I didn't think it was, you know, it was, I, I, I thought, man, you know, he's Pastor Huffman's son. He's a good young man getting, you know, more and more involved in the ministry. And we invited him to preach. And he came down and did an awesome job. And a few days later, Pastor Huffman called me. And he said, you know, he said, a lot of people have asked me to come preach. And we'd had him too. He said, a lot of people asked me to preach. He goes, but I hadn't had anybody ask my son to come preach. And he said, I just want you to know how much that I appreciated that. Because when you love my son, you're showing that you love me. So when we show people we love their children, they're going to come out with the same understanding you love my kids means you love me can you get hooked up with me yes. hallelujah if we could get the ushers to come up here just a minute please 
this is what I want to do. Please, I'd, I'd like to ask you to do something. Come up here, please. Stand one, one on my left, one on my right, please. I just, I actually, just need two. I just need two, two guys with with buckets right here. Yeah, yeah. Thank you, guys. What I want to do is, I want to ask you if you're pledging this morning. If you're not, no, do not, please, do not, do not be pressured. The Bible says, do not give grudgingly or of necessity. I'm not going to start and change that. But we're going to pledge. Come on, baby. You pledging with me? Absolutely. Absolutely, she says. So if you've got something that you want to, that you're going to pledge, you've got a pledge card filled out. I want to ask you to do something. I want to ask you to come up here. And I want you to just do that right, right there. And then I want you to stay in the front. Just stay up here just for a moment. We're going to pray. And then we are going to just ask God to bless what it is that's going to come in. He's going to use it for the kingdom of God. And we're going to see some great things that are going to take place. So if you're if you're doing anything, jump up, and come on up here, and uh, drop this in in here. And we're going to just stand around here just for a moment, and we're going to pray over it, just as it, as if it was an offering, because it is an offering. It is an offering. So that's what we're that's what we're doing. So just come up here and just come around. If you want to kneel here in just a moment, you can kneel, or if you want to stand right here, we'll just stand however you want to do, whatever you're comfortable with. No pressure. You do what we only, it's an invitation. Simply that. And if you didn't come prepared today, but you say, hey, I want to be a part of that, I just need time to think about it, we're going to do it again next, next Sunday in, on the, on the, in the, uh, during the offering portion of it. So would you all stand, please? Everybody just stand. Would you just grab someone's hand next to you? You want Steve? Set that down if you want and grab our hand there. Yeah, there we go. We're just going to pray. We're going to believe God that as this comes in, we're going to get everything we need. I have no doubt about that. I'm not the least bit concerned about it. I have no doubt God is going to bring what we need in. And, uh, and once it's done, I'm telling you, we're going to use this for the kingdom of God. You're going to be so happy. You're going to be so blessed. You're going to say, man, I want to invite people to my church. Not that you don't now, but it be even greater. Amen. So let's pray right now. Heavenly Father, we are so grateful and honored and thank you, Lord, for what you're doing in our lives individually. Help us to bear the fruit that you want us to bear. Help us to be the best fruit bearers that we can possibly be, to minister to people's lives, to help lead them into the kingdom of your dear Son. And Father, as the church, as the leader of this church, my desire, Lord, is for our church to bear fruit. That we will be a church that the community recognizes not just for the sake of recognition, but for the sake of people. Knowing, Lord, that we love people and we want to minister to people. We want to see development. We want to see this community change. We're not going to yield just based on things that are happening around us. We're not going to uh, uh, submit to any bad reports, doubts, and unbelief. But Lord, we're going to trust you. We're going to believe you. And as finances come into the kingdom of God through the way of this church, Lord, we're going to be faithful to use them for your kingdom. And we're going to accomplish the things that need to be accomplished because you've commissioned us. And so I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit that ministers to us and gives us life and encouragement. And Father, we thank you. I thank you for every person that can and is willing to to be a part of this and for the folks that can't right now for whatever reason I thank you Lord that their heart is with us that they'll be with us in prayer they'll also be with us at times that maybe just it's a volunteer uh, thing that we can use the help on as we begin this process I bless them all Father I thank you for them all I thank you for the heart that they have to be a part of Kingsway Church and help us to be the greatest church that this community can possibly have that will be the greatest witness for your kingdom so I bless you I honor you and I thank you for giving us divine direction and divine help to build your kingdom and we thank you for it today in Jesus name we pray amen and amen praise the Lord